Greetings everyone. Today I want to talk a little bit about game design and a game that I am working on right now. Um, now, as a game master and a player, I'm not someone who's very concerned about the crunchier aspects of games. I like simple rule systems, and I have a couple of ideas for systems I uh, might try and use for this game, but that's not really what I'm interested in. Um, I am always more drawn into a game by its setting, and uh, I want to create a compelling setting, and I think I have kind of the uh, cool broad strokes of a setting set out already. So I want to talk about that, but first I want to talk about the ideas that inspired this, and if you'll bear with me for a little while, I think this is going to be kind of a long video, uh, but I think you're going to be pretty interested in it. Uh, so last year when, uh, around this time, I was at an event in New Hampshire uh, called the Porcupine Freedom Festival. Uh, I'm a libertarian, so and this was a, an event for libertarians. Uh, about 1,500 people showed up, I think. I'm sorry, my kitten is attacking my foot. Uh, about 15 people, 1,500 people were there. Uh, it's like a week-long party, and there's all sorts of uh, speakers and events there as well. Uh, the speakers range from PhD economists and political philosophers to people who are just interested in uh, DIY home stuff. Uh, to talks on like philosophical views on different styles of parenting, uh, art, basically any topic you could think of. I was fortunate enough last year to have one of my friends there who was giving a talk. Um, his name is Perry, and he's one of the smartest people I've met in my entire life. Right now he's a PhD candidate um, writing his dissertation on what's called atomically precise manufacturing, or nanotechnology. Um, so he gave a talk on this event called the Singularity that is on the horizon for human society. Uh, if you don't know what the uh, and his talk is online, it's uh, there's a YouTube video of it uh, that I will link to in the description. I highly recommend t checking it out. It is fascinating. It's awesome. It's like maybe 40 minutes long, um, and it's it's really incredible. Um, but for those of you who are too lazy to lo look at that link. Uh, he talked about the singularity in terms of human evolution and uh, the kind of scale of technological breakthroughs in humanity. So the singularity itself is an event in which technological breakthroughs become so kind of powerful and happen so rapidly that our ability to understand the, uh, the future or to understand <laughs> reality kind of breaks down. It's something that our minds the boundaries of our minds simply don't allow us to uh, to understand or comprehend at this point. Um, and he started talking off about the major technological breakthroughs and how the gap in time between each of these breakthroughs um, became shorter and shorter and shorter. And the reason was each one of these breakthroughs set the groundwork for the next breakthrough. So the first one was like a Homo habilis sitting, uh, you know, in a valley somewhere chipping a stone tool, and how this stone tool. Uh, you know, allowed him to, to feed himself and his family more, made his life uh, more positive. Uh, it allowed him to do things that he could not physically do himself, uh, no matter how primitive it was. But this started shaping our evolution. Uh, we started getting uh, naturally selected for power grips and for bigger and smarter brains. Uh, and this is why uh, we are different from chimpanzees and our other uh, evolutionary cousins, um, the other apes. Um, and how after creating tools, it took something like another 100,000 years before we invented like agriculture. And then shortly after agriculture, we invented writing. And uh, writing was the first information, uh, information science breakthrough that we ever had. Because literally, if you knew something and you didn't tell someone else about it, or they forgot about it after you died, all of your knowledge was gone forever. So basically human society was starting from zero every single time, every single generation, until we invented writing, which allowed us to pass on information. And it's not long after writing is invented that you get uh, material science advances like uh, bronze. Um, and the gap, again, the gap between these, these inventions gets smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. You eventually get books, which allow you to concentrate an enormous amount of information in one place. Then you get the printing press, which allows information to just be mass produced. And that's when uh, technological breakthroughs start happening faster and faster and faster. And the same thing with the invention of machine tools, uh, tools that allow you to make standardized screws and other things. These, um, these inventions that allow you to, uh, tools that allow you to make better tools. 
Uh, once you get to something like the, the 18th and 19th century, you're getting technological breakthroughs, um, huge breakthroughs every single year. I mean, you could probably make a, like a, a list that would fill like volumes of, of books, you know. Um, and then you get the invention of the computer, the electronic computer. And sorry, my cat is bothering me again. Uh, and the computer is one of the most important inventions of all time. This is a tool that is a generalized tool that has allowed us to do everything. It allows us to do math problems, play video games, do all sorts of really, really interesting stuff. And uh, then he explained what Moore's Law is. Moore's Law states that roughly eight, every 18 months, computer speeds double. A lot of you probably have already known that. Um, and that's an incredibly revolutionary thing. And uh, he explained it in a way that I had never really thought of it before. This doesn't just mean like, oh, your computer is twice as fast 18 months later. It means that... Okay, cat. <laughs> Cat's on the computer. Um, it means that every 18 months, we are able to make as many transistors, as much computing power as we have in all of human history up to that point. So 18 months after that, you have made as much computing power as had been made up until that point in history and so on and so on and so on. So right now, we're swimming in technological uh, revolution and innovation. It's, it's incredible. I mean, we, a lot of times we don't really think about it because we are swimming in it. We don't have an objective view on this, but we're living at a time when uh, technological breakthrough is accelerating at such an incredible pace that um, we're very, very close to having the singularity happen. And the two things that are probably going to be the trigger for this are the invention of atomically precise manufacturing, which is nanotechnology, where you can actually create uh, atomic scale and molecular scale robotics and machines. You can build anything, literally anything you want once you get atomically precise manufacturing, as long as it doesn't violate the laws of physics. That opens doors to things that we can't even possibly imagine. Um, now, coupling that with the most important thing that we can make, which is artificial intelligence. Uh, a computer is an incredible tool. We have clusters of computers that are uh, as smart, or at least can, in terms of the number of operations per second they can complete, are as fast or faster than a human brain. However, they can't think. They don't do anything on their own. You have to tell them in extremely explicit and excruciating detail uh, what to do because they are not thinking machines. They just do what you tell them to do. Uh, if you can create a mind, however, that is revolutionary uh, because that is a general purpose tool. It is, it is something that can, it can tackle problems you haven't even thought of. It can, uh, it can think about the problems as, as opposed to having to be told what to do each time. Now, what's interesting about this is once you couple this with atomically precise manufacturing, you can get uh, you can build computers. Um, now, if you were to be absurdly conservative, you could create a computer that was, if you were to model it off of the way a human brain works, which would be stupid. You would never, you would never make it that way. But just considering the sped up human brain model, you could make a computer that was a million times faster than the human brain. What this means is that you could theoretically have a computer that you built, you turn it on, tell it to do some research, and it could complete a thousand years worth of engineering research, prototyping, and simulation in two hours. Human beings aren't used to that. What happens to human society when you have a computer that can do that kind of research and prototyping development that quickly? Uh, and it can then build computers that could be a million times faster than it. As long as it's not violating the laws of physics, they can build it. Um, that's where things get really weird really fast. That's the type of thing where it's like within 30 days human society is transformed into something uh, totally unrecognizable. And it's scary, but it's also exciting. Uh, now, that event is the singularity. Now, if this were to happen, if this transformation were to happen, there, there's been a couple of game lines that have been set post-singularity. Uh, it's, it's very difficult to write fiction or literature about something that happens after the singularity because we can't possibly conceive what it's going to be like after that point. But the big game that has done that is Eclipse Phase. And it's a game that I didn't really even know about until recently when I started thinking about this game that I want to make. Um, 
But uh, they set it post singularity, and it's very interesting. It's an awesome setting. I haven't checked out the system, uh, but I've heard nothing but good things about it. Um, I would like to set a game before the singularity, right before the singularity. If you were to take uh, all of human evolutionary history and condense it into the period of a day, um, a 24 hour period, right now in human history, we're about a minute or two away from the singularity happening. Uh, whether it happens in 30 years or 300 years is really irrelevant. It's within the span of a few human lifetimes. Uh, this is actually going to happen. Um, and if we're a minute away from that happening in terms of the, you know, the evolutionary day, I want to set a game that's only a few seconds away from it happening. And uh, I want to take technologies that are emerging right now and kind of extrapolate them uh, and the consequences of, of their invention into the future. So aesthetically, the game that I would like to uh, create, the setting looks very similar to a cyberpunk world like Ghost in the Shell. Um, however, that is a, a, all of the kind of cyberpunk uh, games and media that's been created, really the ideas, they focus on like one change, which would be like the integration of computers with the human mind. And they, they make a, a universe that is only extrapolated off of that one thing. They don't really talk about how that would change uh, institutions of government um, and law and uh, the ways in which we, uh, we deal with one another. And I want to look at kind of the different ways in which simultaneously we can, uh, we can look at changes where like basically overnight the internet, all digital networks and communication becomes totally encrypted. So government agencies like the NSA, anybody trying to do electronic surveillance, uh, the internet goes dark. So our online lives become super, super private. We will have more privacy than in all of human history. We will never have had this much privacy. Um, however, at the same time, uh, and I'm pulling uh, some of these ideas from a book by David Friedman called Future Imperfect, um, you have you know, cameras that are like the size of a mosquito flying around. Uh, and in the real world, in your personal life, you're under constant surveillance. But the people who are putting you under surveillance are also under surveillance. So you have at the same time, you have this frighteningly private world uh, of online digital communication, which through networking the human mind and the different kind of cybernetic augmentations that characters can, can have, gives you total privacy. Uh, being juxtaposed with at the same time having zero privacy. They're two <laughs> very different things, but they happen simultaneously. Um, and coupling that with advances in uh, like cryptocurrency, uh, for instance, uh, you may know about Bitcoin, which is a um, pseudonymous, uh, not anonymous, uh, I wish it was anonymous, uh, digital form of money. And the different things that this, that this will allow. Um, Currently, and this is a real thing, you can look this up, there is a Bitcoin assassination market that's already been set up. And the idea behind this was conceived of maybe 15 years ago by uh, a crypto anarchist talking about the idea of being able to put um, a bounty on the head of, of politicians or, or government officials that you don't like. People that uh, have committed crimes and gotten away with it, you can put a price on their head. And uh, the money gets put into escrow, and if someone successfully assassinates them and allows them to, and, and provides uh, a sort of proof, and there's a lot more detail on this, but provides a proof of it, then that money gets transferred to them anonymously and digitally, instantaneously. Uh, so you get political assassination markets and murder for hire businesses start popping up because since these communications are anonymous, uh, there's no need for face-to-face -face interaction. There's no need for this, this element of trust. All of these elements are completely trustless, so it becomes very dangerous to become a politician. Um, now, this is a lot of my, my own libertarian anarchism coming out. Uh, this is the kind of <laughs> world that I would find interesting, um, is if these assassinations actually started taking place. The markets exist. Uh, there are prices on politicians' heads right now. Nothing has come of it yet. Um, but if these assassinations start becoming, uh, start actually happening, and since technology starts decentralizing power in society, individual human beings are able to uh, augment their 
uh, their abilities, their, their cognitive uh, faculties, everything, becomes very dangerous to become a politician. And so this starts having a, a very uh, different effect on the way that governments operate. Um, in the third world, this starts, uh, this starts happening all the time. And it starts forcing these governments to be a little bit, uh, to, to be more accountable to their people because they become fearful for their own lives, more fearful than they already are. Um, in the first world, when these assassinations are carried out, um, the people who are ideologically behind it and, uh, and trying to create like this kind of anarchism, this anarchist society, it starts to backfire a bit because uh, most people identify with politicians and they're looked at as, as martyrs. Um, and so these, these kind of uh, libertarian crypto anarchists that are, that are fueling this political change and are having uh, an institutional effect on it, they're making politicians more afraid to be politicians. At the same time, they shore up the belief in the state as a legitimate institution. And so the states uh, are able to become slightly more oppressive. However, in tandem with this, since we have the dark market, you can get any illicit service that you want, other services that have been prohibited by governments begin to pop up online and begin, uh, supported by all this technological revolution, begin to actually be feasible. And the second is alternative legal systems. Alternative systems of law, courts, arbitration, everything starts popping up. So when people are for, uh, faced with no recourse against uh, people who have wronged them, or, or maybe politicians get off the hook for doing something, uh, you know, police brutality occurs and, and police are not held accountable, uh, people are able to go online um, and sell claims to their, their, the, the violations of their rights. They can, they can bring people to court uh, within the private capitalist legal systems. Um, and these things begin to compete with states. Uh, so you get this this legal kind of anarchy going uh, going around, but it, it starts to work and have it has positive effects in some ways and negative effects in others. Uh, places in the third world where you know uh, like men and this happens, it's horrible. You know, men throw acid on women's faces who deny them uh, affection and attention, uh, and these these women usually are horribly burned. Many of them die. Um, the through these anonymized markets start having recourse, uh, whereas the previous legal systems might have protected or uh, failed to prosecute these people. Um, they're brought to justice by private organizations looking to turn a buck. Uh, and so characters can work for these different governments or these different uh, kind of black market legal organizations, or they can work uh, in these assassination rings. Um, and they can do so, uh, each character kind of, the, the analog would be races in fantasy. Uh, each, each one of these kind of transhumans, uh, different types, have a specific set of core augmentations that they've made to their body or their brain. And this is what differ differentiates them from one another. This is why they have different statistical modifiers, uh, different ability sets available to them. Um, but... Uh, your kind of heroes of the game can play within these competing factions and they can play within this 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 dark market on the internet um and uh and kind of bring justice or or injustice to those you can pull off heists um there's uh, i have the idea that uh basically like uh you can play this out also as an apocalyptic scenario um where you're contacted through uh, one of these these uh, information networks. Um, someone is hiring you to do pull off these these kind of ridiculous uh, high risk missions, and as you complete them, you're paid and you're paid handsomely. Uh, but different things in the world start things start happening as a result of the of the missions that you're completing, and these uh, it it starts to dawn on you that this information network you're not being hired by a human or an organization, some some mega corporation to uh, to to complete its goals, what you're doing is removing restrictions on an artificial intelligence network. Uh, there's there's a supercomputer that has uh, you know built-in uh, restrictions and blocks on it. It's slowly removing those, and once uh, those are removed, a singularity event is triggered. And this can either be you know a horrible uh, nightmare scenario, or it could uh, end up 
as a reward to the players is something like a, uh, you know, bringing paradise, heaven on earth. And um, so, yeah, it'd be uh, very much cyberpunk in tone um, and about the, uh, the world vastly, vastly changing in a short amount of time, uh, institutions and, and governments changing as a result of the pressures of technology, not because people have different ideological motivations like, oh, well, we don't want to be Republicans or Democrats anymore, but because, oh, I can hire someone to kill a politician for me, uh, or I can hire a, a private security network to, uh, to keep me alive because, oh my God, I've, I pissed someone off. I'm on an assassination list. I'm on the assassination market and someone's put a bounty on my head. Um, and there's a lot more that can be done with this, too, because I like the idea of incorporating the ideas of startup cities and seasteads, which are uh, two real-world movements that are, trying to, that are gaining traction right now, uh, where new fictional cities can arise out of nowhere uh, that, that are experimenting with vastly different types of, of government than we have now, than our standard uh, Western democracies and, and things like that, uh, where these impoverished countries allow independent private contractors to come in and, and start... Uh, building cities for them and, and using different legal systems. Um, and they can all be vastly different from one another. Uh, you can have combinations of uh, weird, like weird combinations of, of semi-capitalistic, semi-socialistic institutions. Um, if you can come up with new forms of uh, digital government governing these, these geographic territories, uh, so you can create uh, vastly different settings than like, oh, we're going to play in New York or Washington, D.C. Or, or London or someplace like this. You can create entirely new cities on Earth. Uh, seasteading allows for something interesting as well, where vast cities are being built on platforms in the ocean. And these platforms are modular, so they can decouple from one another. Entire cities, if, if people don't like uh, the way that their government is, is operating, uh, people can detach their businesses and their homes and leave and recombine on a different... Uh, to a different colony. And so you have a physically changing political landscape as well. And uh, the idea that you can have these, these uh, startup cities and seasteads as these bastions of scientific innovation and uh, scientific progress, this is where you know experiments that aren't allowed to be con uh, conducted within the borders of currently existing countries because the governments won't allow it uh, are happening elsewhere. And um, how are the states responding to this? And by the way, this is a real-world mo movement to try and build uh, seasteads and startup cities. Those, those are real things. But I'd like to create a game where they already exist, and they are already having an effect on existing institutions. Uh, so it would be a world that is uh, at once very familiar to the gamers, uh, but at the same time drastically different than it is now. Um, so, uh, let me know if this is something that you're interested in. There's a lot more to it. Um, as I uh, start kind of organizing my thoughts on this a little more, I'll make some more videos. But that is a game that I think would be very interesting. Uh, it, it would allow you to create any number of characters, um, any number of plot lines. Uh, the different competing factions and organizations uh, could provide ample role-playing opportunities. And uh, if I do make this... Um, I will make this under a Creative Commons license. So if people want to uh, remix and uh, create their own content for it, they will be able to do so. Um, just like uh, Eclipse Phase. I think that's a wonderful part of their system. Except that I would take it a step farther and make it an attribution license, not a, not a share like non commercial. So you could actually sell it if you wanted to. Uh, but at any rate, that's, uh, that's what I'm thinking right now. Uh, if you found this interesting or at all, let me know. And. Um, Maybe I'll make another video about this soon.